Today, I want, I want to talk to you about finishing strong. Finishing strong. Now, when we think about finishing strong, maybe the picture that comes into your mind is one of running a race, and that's very appropriate. Um, how many of you are runners here? Any of you guys are runners? We have a few runners. How many of you have run at least in a 5K run? Oh, a number of you. How about a 10K? Any 10Kers? That's pretty good. How about uh, half marathons? Any? Wow. Um, any, any full marathoners? Wow, that's impressive. Okay. How about um, any, anybody done a Tough Mudder? Tough Mudder. Woo-hoo. How come it's always this, this section over here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we have Amos over there. All right. <laughs> Anybody do a triathlon? Triathlon? Whoa, we got triathlons? Wow, that's really sick. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> um, you know, I really, for me, I, I don't like running. I can't imagine running unless I'm dribbling a basketball. That's the only time I'll run. And um, um, it, it, to me, running is kind of torturous. It, it's really just painful. And I remember um, for, for me, um, when I read verses that speak of running, you know, because the pastor we're going to look at today talks about, kind of likens our life as a race. And there's something for me that's a little bit of a disconnect because I don't like running. Uh, I went running one time. There was a uh, handful of guys from the church. We were in in this uh, place where we were trying to get in shape. And it was, it was, no, it wasn't fun. It was, it was a lot of hard work. And so what we did was we got together and one day we thought we would go running. And there's, I don't know, four or five of us. So we went running and it was just awful. And I knew I was in, you know, we were going to run, I think, two miles. Two miles. That's not much, right? Right? I knew I was in trouble after 200 yards. I was winded. <laughs> I was hurting. I was feeling the burn. I was, it was just terrible. And, um, you know, I, I, I feel like running is not enjoyable. It's just something to get through. And I was just trying to get through it. I was just trying to make it, you know, and I was barely making it. And, and you know, when you look at our, our Christian life, sometimes some of us are just trying to get through it. You know, it's just hard. And, and our perspective is, man, life is hard, and I just want to get through it. But I think God has so much more for us than that. There are other people that when it comes to running, they really enjoy it. I mean, yeah, it's hard for them. It's probably hard for all the runners, but they also see other things as they're running. They, they see it as a chance to run with other people. They see it as a chance to be in nature. They enjoy, you know, the scenery as they're running. They enjoy the thrill of, of accomplishing something, their goals. They love the fact that they see themselves getting stronger and faster and things like that, and they're able to go longer distances. And for them, it's a time to maybe even connect with God as they're running and you know, their perspective on a race is a lot different. Well, today we want to talk about finishing strong. We want to look at Hebrews 12 and what it, what it says about this race of life and how you and I could finish strong. And I think there's some really important things in here that if we take to heart, we will find that we can actually enjoy the race and we could get to the end and feel good and feel like, wow. That was a life well lived. We finished strong. Okay, so if you would, I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 13. This is what it says. Let's go ahead and stand up as we read. This is what God's word says to us today. Hebrews 12, 1 through 13. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Amen. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> okay, so we're in the book of Hebrews, and the passage begins with therefore, and therefore always causes us to look back at what took place before. And if you would recall, in Hebrews chapter 11, which has been commonly referred to as the hall of faith, there were several different characters that we went through and looked at who were, who were commended for their faith. Abel is one of them. Abel, he offered his worshipful offering to the Lord. Enoch is commended for his faith walk with God. Noah, it talks about Noah and his faith to build the ark just because God told him that he was going to send the flood. Okay, Abraham and his faith to leave all that he knew. To go to a land he had never been to. And then not only that, once he got to the land, to sacrifice his son of promise because God asked him to do so. Moses and his faith to leave his life of privilege to then join himself with God's people. And then Rahab, who Pastor Duane spoke of last week. Rahab, who, who had the faith to, to help the spies, the Jewish spies, and at the cost of turning against her own people. People of faith. People of faith throughout the, whole, the Old Testament. And so in light of these people of faith, it says there in verse 1 of chapter 12, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, it begins with this great cloud of witnesses. Now, one image you could get is this stadium filled with witnesses, the Old Testament witnesses, those who have gone before us, and they are watching us. They are looking at us and cheering us on. And that's one image you could have. And I would say that that could be what the author is talking about. But another way of looking at this passage is that these great, this great cloud of witnesses were witnesses of the faithfulness of God. They gave testimony through their lives of the faithfulness of God and because of their faith, and we see their faith, and what their faith uh, speaks of about this amazing God who we worship, because of that, we join with them, and we live lives of faith. These are things that now we can look at in the scriptures, and we ask ourselves, how is it that we could join with these folks? these people, these great people of faith, so that we might become also a great cloud of witnesses to others. Let me share with you 
five things that this passage speaks of so that you and I can live a life of faith and finish strong. See, because all these men and women, they finish strong. And so we want to look at them and look at, look at um, what this passage tells us about how we can finish strong. The first thing is finishing strong requires living unshackled. It says here that we need to throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And the picture there is that sin has a way of wrapping itself around our spiritual legs and we can't make progress as God would want us to. You know, when we look at the saints of old, when we look at, at um, uh, Abel, when we look at Abel, he had to throw off the fear of God not providing for him. He offered this wonderful sacrifice of first fruits of, of the best of his flocks. But the fear, the, the thing that would have shackled him that he had to get rid of is that sense that, oh God, he's not going to provide for me. He threw that away. He got rid of that. You know, in order for Enoch to walk with God, he had to live an unhurried life. He had to get rid of this life of busyness that's so busy that he couldn't spend time with God. For Noah, for Noah to build the ark, he had to get rid of the doubt because he had never seen a flood before. He had never even seen rain before. And God said he's going to bring this, this flood and it was getting rid of that doubt that says, I've never seen it before, but I'm going to trust God. Abraham had to throw off the security that comes from familiarity. He, he left his place, his homeland, which he was very familiar with, and he went to a new country that he had never been before. Moses had to disentangle himself. He had to disentangle himself from all the privileges of growing up and living in Pharaoh's household. He had to disentangle himself from worldly riches in order for him to then join himself with the people of God. And Rahab, Rahab had to overcome her sordid past as a prostitute in order for her to claim and hold on to the fact that she was worth saving. She was worth, it was worth joining herself with the spies and helping them. And, and in so doing, claiming for herself rescue from the, 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 the uh, Israelite army that would invade the land. We have to get rid of. All the things that would keep us from following the Lord Jesus Christ. In my, in my own journey of faith, one of the things that God has helped me to overcome, and he's still helping me to overcome, is getting, getting so wrapped up or so concerned with what people think about me. When... What I've noticed is the more secure I am in my own identity in Christ, the less I'm concerned with what people think about me, which frees me up then to say what I need to say and to do what I need to do and to tell people what they need to hear more so than what they want to hear. It's a freeing thing that God wants to, has done in my life. And it's important for us to understand that all of us have something that is wrapped around our spiritual legs. All of us have things in our lives that God wants us to cut and to get rid of. And that's why it's been so great. And what we're going to continue to do is encourage people to deal with the things that hold them. We want to, in, in 2015... We want to look very closely at this issue of freedom. And so all of us, all of us have things that keep us down, that keep us from running this race 
the way God wants us to run it. And you can either deal with it or you can ignore it. Now, here's the thing. If you choose to ignore it, God still loves you. But if you choose to ignore it, you make it very hard for the people around you to love you. You make it difficult to live with. If you're not dealing with your stuff, you are hard to live with. And people are gracious. They could be gracious. And, they, and, and we want to be gracious. We want to accept each other for, for how we are. But we want to also be people who deal, who allow God to deal with our stuff. So if you have anger, God wants you to deal with that. And if you have excessive worry in your life, God wants you to deal with that. Because you know what? It's not just affecting you. It's affecting those around you. And you can't live and finish strong if you're carrying all this weight around you, with you. And that's why we want to continue to encourage each other to live unshackled. The second thing. Finishing strong requires us to run the race marked out for us. Run the race marked out for you. Isn't it true There's a difference between running and running a race. When you run in a race, you don't just show up and say, I'm going to make up where I get to go. I'm just going to run wherever I want to run. No, when you run a race, the, the course has been set for you. In the same way, the course has been set for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us the course that we are called to run. And that course entails two very important things, the great commandment and the great commission. And the great commandment we know is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, to love your neighbors as yourself. That's a great commandment. And the great commission is going to make disciples. We don't get to make up our own great commandment. And we don't get to commission ourselves in saying, this is what I want my life to be about. He has set, he has marked our race for us. Now, how that gets expressed in our individual lives may look different. It may look different for some. But you know what? There's a common theme in all of our lives, and that is we are called to love God, love people, and to help other people know God and love him and love people. Could you imagine showing up to a race and everybody's facing one way and they start running and you say, you're part of the race, but then you say, I'm going to go off-roading. I'm going to do my own thing. And you start running and then you cut down different streets. No, that's not how you run a race. You run the race, the course that God has set for you. And when you do so, you'll find the joy and the pleasure of knowing that you're doing it with the Lord. See, some of us want to live life and we want to say, God, would you bless my life? And how could he bless your life when you are running your own race? You're running and you're, you're, you're trying to do and live life the way You want to live it as opposed to the way he wants you to live it. And then you're saying, God bless it. And then you get frustrated because you don't see his blessing in your life. Run the race marked out for us. Thirdly, finishing strong requires fixing our eyes on Jesus. Verse 2 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus keeps us in the race. Um, It says here, that Jesus ran his race. He says, But for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What was the joy set before Jesus? How is it that he could endure the cross? How could it be that he could 
go live his life and and know that his life was going to end up at the cross and he was able to go there and endure it. It was for the joy set before him. What was that joy? I think that joy was you and it was me and it was the saints and it was seeing the people who that cross would ultimately redeem. That he knew that that cross was going to be the mechanism by which he would save us. And it was that joy of knowing that he was, he was providing the way of salvation for us that allowed him to endure the cross. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We understand that when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we can learn from him as well as how he was able to endure, how he was able to look beyond the pain of what he had to go through. Have you ever noticed that those who fix their eyes on Jesus, this is what they don't do. People who fix their eyes on Jesus, you don't hear them complain much about their sacrifice. Have you ever noticed that? People who are fixing their eyes on Jesus, you rarely, if ever, hear them talk about their own sacrifice. Why is that? It's because people who fix their eyes on Jesus, they understand that whatever sacrifice they are making, it pales in comparison to Jesus' sacrifice. And it doesn't even seem, it, it, just, it, it would just be wrong to talk about your own sacrifice of how hard you're working or all that you're giving up when you see what Jesus has done for you. And so those who fix their eyes on Jesus, you don't hear a lot of whining and complaining from those folks. But you do hear the whining and complaining and the, oh, woe is me, look at how hard my life is by those who have taken their eyes off Jesus. You can always tell because it comes through in, in what they say and what they complain about. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And when your eyes are fixed on him, the things that we go through pale. And we look at that and we go, you know what? It's not about me anymore. It's about him. Fourthly, finishing strong requires seeing the good in the hard. Seeing the good in the hard. The word says for us to consider hardships as discipline. And then it goes to this long kind of discourse on, you know what? God, he's treating you as a child, as a son or daughter of him. Because every loving parent will discipline their kids. If you're not disciplined by God, that would mean he doesn't love you. But because you go through a hard thing, that means he loves you. And that could change our whole understanding of what we're going through right now. Because I can guarantee you, probably right now, every one of us is going through something hard. You're either going through something hard because your, your health is failing. You're going through a hard relationship right now. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe um, things at work are not going well. Maybe your career isn't going as you thought. Maybe you didn't get into your program like you wanted to. Every one of us is facing something hard. And what we need to do is see that, God, you are loving me in this. You are loving me. Because you are creating in me something that could not be created and formed without this. And God is forging you in that, in that fire of adversity so that you might come become righteous, it says. That there might be a harvest of righteousness that flows out of your life. And it also says that there might be a harvest of peace that comes out of your life. And that's the peace that says, you know what? It's not about getting through it and having the peace. It's that peace that I can experience while I'm in it. The peace while I'm in it. And that's a peace that goes beyond what the world can offer us. That right now, 
whatever you're facing, you can have the peace of God. When you know that God is with you, and he has allowed this to happen, it doesn't mean it's good, but he has allowed this hard thing to happen so that there might be good produced from it. That's how loving God is. That's how amazing God is. That means when we are in something, we have to understand that the first thought isn't how we get out of it. The first thought should not be how we get out of this hard thing. The first thought is, God, what do you want me to get out of this thing? What do you want me to learn from this? What are you shaping me to be in this? When we run uh, unshackled from sin, when we run our race marked out for us, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, when we see the good in the hard thing, then we are doing what this passage says near the end, where it says, we are strengthening our feeble arms. We are strengthening our weak knees. We are becoming stronger. That's so important. If we are going to run the race marked out for us, if we're going to finish strong, we have to become stronger. Recently, uh, God has put on my heart Jeremiah 12. And Jeremiah 12, if you read it, it's an interesting passage because Jeremiah is complaining to God. He's saying, God, I don't get it. The wicked are, are, are prospering. And Jeremiah, you could just feel it. He's so frustrated. And you could get this sense that he, he wants to quit. He's, he, he looks around him, the righteous suffer, the wicked prosper. God, where are you? You ever feel that way? You ever feel like, man, how come, how come those who don't know you, God, seem to live an easy life? Why is it, God, that those who don't know you don't seem to have the same problems that I have, and I'm trying to follow you? You ever feel that? And it's so interesting because God's response to Jeremiah is this. He says, if you ran with people and get weary and tired, how are you going to run with horses? Huh? In other words, he's saying, if you are getting discouraged and tired and worn out and disillusioned by what you see around you, how are you going to handle it when things really get tough? He's telling Jeremiah, you need to get stronger, dude. You need to get stronger. Because you know what? Your own family is going to betray you. Are you ready for that? Are you strong enough for that? We need to be stronger. We need to commit ourselves to growing so that when the hard things come, and you think it, it's hard now, it is going to get harder. And we need to be stronger to face these hard things. We know the world is going crazy. We have people who are thinking they're following God, and by doing so, they're cutting off people's heads. That's the kind of world we live in. I don't know if you're aware of this, but recently, the mayor of Houston asked five pastors to turn in their sermons to her. Because she wanted to look to see what they were preaching on. And if there was some things that they were saying against this ordinance that they had passed that allows those who might be men but identify themselves as women and they should be allowed to go into women's bathrooms. And there are Christians who are saying this is wrong. And the mayor of Houston subpoenaed their, them, demanding that they turn in their sermons. And there was such an outcry, she rescinded that. But we have, to, we have to look at what's happening. 
it is going to get harder to follow Christ. It is going to get harder to say, I believe in Jesus. And if you think it's hard now, I don't think we've seen anything yet. The writer says, you have not suffered to the point of shedding your blood yet. There, there will come a time, and I don't know how far along, how far away it is, but even in our country, it's going to probably come a time when that's going to take on that extreme form of persecution. We see it in other countries. I don't think we should think that we will be spared. At the end of this passage, it says, you know, when we do this, when we, when we strengthen our feeble arms, when we strengthen our weak knees, when we make level paths for our feet, it says that, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. The lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. What does that mean? There's going to be, there's an impact. There's an impact there, that we're in connection with one another. And when we get stronger, when we strengthen ourselves, there's an impact on other people that those who are weak get stronger. And when those who are weak get stronger, other people who are weak get stronger. And it just shows how much we need one another. And that's the fifth and final point. Finishing strong requires us to run with others. We need one another. We need to walk alongside each other. We need the body of Christ. We need to be encouraging one another to stay true to God's word, to stay true to him. Runners uh, have told me that uh, the, the, it seems like the most common theme for runners, for them to continue to run or continue to, to improve their time, to continue to go further, is that they need a partner. If you have someone you're running with, you're much more likely to finish strong in a race. You're much more likely to continue to do the hard thing. It's a common theme. And what's true of running a physical race, I think, is true in our spiritual race as well. Um, Amy Ng has this great story about her run. She was running in a half marathon, she told me, at, at, in Florida at Disney World. And she was running... And she said that it was a half marathon. I think, what is that, 13 miles? Is that 13 miles, something around there? She was at the nine-mile mark, she said. And she hit that wall, and she, was, she didn't think she could go on. And, and she was talking to God. She was praying to God, and she was telling I, you know, she couldn't go on. And she said that as she was calling out to God and telling him, you know, she felt like quitting, she gets a phone call. She got a phone call. And it was Charlotte who called her. And Charlotte called her just to encourage her. And, and it was right at the perfect moment where she got that phone. I mean, who calls during a race, right? <laughs> I mean, but it was at this perfect moment, you know? It's so funny. And, you know, she kind of figured it out. She was in Florida. It was about 7 or 8 in the morning in Florida. That means it was about 4 or 5 in the morning here. And she gets this call. And after she hangs up, you know, she starts crying and, you know, she just feels like, wow, that was the perfect timing for this phone call. It's funny. This is what she says. She says, I told her it was amazing that she called me right at that moment when I needed encouragement. Who calls someone when they're racing? Well, only my kids to ask if they could watch TV because dad is sleeping. <laughs> really? And she says, thank you so much for encouraging me, I told her. I cried right after I hung up the phone because it was at that time when I really needed someone to encourage me, and she called me and took the action to do that. And Amy finished that race, she said. She finished it, and she got this really beautiful pink medal. <laughs> she finished. We need each other. We need the encouragement of one another. And so I want to just ask you, who do you have in your life that 
you're running the race with. Let me get even more specific. Can you name two people that you are running the race with? And I'm not talking about two people you like to hang out with, two people you like to watch the game with. I'm not talking about two people that, you know, you have a, a, an occasional relationship with. I'm talking about two people in your life who will encourage you to run this race with Jesus. Two people who will ask you the tough questions. This, these are the people who will ask you this question. How are you and Jesus doing? Two people. Do you have two people in your life who will have the, the, the guts to say, you know what? I saw, it seems like, you're kind of slipping. You're, you know, I haven't seen you around. Um, what's going on in your life? Do you have two people like that? And here's what I want you to do. If you have two people like that, then I want you to contact them and just say thank you. Thank you that you are this person in my life. And I want to be this person in your life. And I know we have a great friendship, but our friendship goes deeper than that. I, I, I just appreciate you because you are someone who encourages me. You are someone who's willing to ask me the hard questions. You are someone who, who regularly just points me back to Jesus. And I just want to thank you. And if you only have one person like that in your life, or you don't have anybody like that in your life, this is what I want you to do. I want you to ask God for two names. Two names. And then I want you to approach the, those, those people and say, would you be this type of person in my life? And I'm committing myself to be this type of person in your life. Because you know what? I went to church on Sunday, and I heard the best sermon in my life. And I got inspired to, to run this race, to finish strong, and to be someone who is part of this great cloud of witnesses that gives testimony to Jesus, who inspires others to run as well. Would you join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, have, you ran the race and you finished strong. Lord, I thank you that you, God, you bore our sin on the cross so that we could have life. You endured it. God, I thank you that because of your sacrifice for us, that we could have life. And you have marked out a race for each one of us. And Lord, we want to just grow stronger. We need to be stronger, God. And so we ask in Jesus' name that you would bless us with two people. Two people who would be like that friend who sticks closer than a brother. Two people who would ask us the hard questions. Two people who would encourage us. Two people that we can ask the hard questions of and not be threatened. Lord Jesus, would you do that? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that we could be a part of your kingdom work here. We love you, God. Lord, keep us from the sin of being hearers of your word and not doers. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.